Hey friends, you're listening to the Hope and Hard Pills podcast where we are exploring practical insight for racial justice and social change. I'm one of your hosts, Andre Henry. And I'm Nandi K. Hey everybody. Today we're speaking with Lauren Duca, journalist and author. So excited. Uh, this was a great interview. Yeah, I really enjoyed um, talking with Lauren. We had a great conversation, like, and we actually became friends after that <laughs> conversation. So I'm really, I'm really glad. Um, but anyway, I'm more excited about people hearing about her book and her perspective on politics and stuff. What did you think of the conversation? I think Lauren just really spoke to so much that I feel is important right now, just about how we can all participate as citizens in this so-called democracy that we have, how her views have changed on democracy and writing her book, even just the research for her book, just shaped her view of how to better participate in democracy and fired her up. I really like that. Her passion was really infectious. Yeah, I really appreciate her commitment to open the political conversation to everyone. And she makes it so accessible. Right. But before we get into the interview, we're going to do some hope notes. So, uh, Nandi, do you have a hope note right now? Yeah. So actually, even with everything that's going on in the world right now, it's rough. But this interview with Lauren gave me hope. It just really speaks to kind of the awakening that's happening right now. And Lauren really is challenging people to act on a regular basis. You know, she talks about Angela Davis and how we have to act like it's consistently possible to change the world. Mm. That gave me so much hope. That is an everyday process, a habit, she calls it. Yeah, mine is similar. That taking action is what is giving me hope. So it's interesting, like when you bring up the Angela Davis quote, we basically have the same one getting out and organizing for change or protesting or whatever. That is what's giving me hope right now, um, because I think that as long as we act, there is hope. There is a chance. Well, I mean, Lauren talks about what kind of actions we can take to actually start a revolution. So I think that's a good segue into the interview. Without any further ado, here is our conversation with Lauren Duca. Hey, Lauren. Hey, Andre. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad that you decided to be on our show. Thank you for having me. Yes, of course. I'm honored. And I'm excited to talk about your new book, How to Start a Revolution. I've heard you describe this many times. And I think that for those who are listening, this would be helpful. That, but you talk about having a kind of political awakening and mm -hmm. kind of a shift in your writing around 2016 that led to you writing this book. And I wondered if you could share some of that with us. Yes. So before Trump's election, I cared about equality and social justice, but didn't understand that that needed to include constant political action. And mm -hmm. I feel silly saying it, but over the course of writing my book, have come to understand that it was socially enforced and part of an overwhelming mm. alienation. But uh, I was into social justice and it really was as complex as growing up and having a lot of gay friends around me. So I didn't even mm. have the word feminism until college and I'm still learning the realities of racial injustice in this country. But it was just seven years old, I feel like I understood Gay people need rights. Mm -hmm. Oh, equality, let's go. And <laughs> other evolutions happened from that point forward. But I, before Trump's election, I was operating as if I was a bystander to the government and a bystander to the status quo that included bigotry and racism and sexism and convinced that mm -hmm. that was going to get better all the time. And, and it kind of <laughs> seemed like it was. And Obama was president and the gays were getting married and these mm -hmm. things were unraveling and, and getting us closer toward what I assumed was our big societal goal of equality. And with the shock of Trump's win, I felt this personal agency and this personal urgency of action and thought, oh, I need to do something about this. Um, and I had been writing about hierarchies of power in the culture, but that was lowercase p political. And it was, I was interested in 
navigating who we are as a society and inquiring into the intricacies of pop culture. And it was all really very passive and observational. And when I had this shift, I thought I need to use my greatest and only skill to make sense of this (laughs) dumpster fire and Mm -hmm. to empower other people to uh, feel a a right and a duty to the political conversation. Mm. That idea of constant political action, that's like a big idea of your book, right? It's essentially like a journalistic snapshot of Mm. this political awakening that is occurring. And so I walk through what are the causes behind alienation, especially as they occur for young people. So Mm. when I had this moment of thinking, I need to write about politics, I wrote a book proposal. And Mm -hmm. the sample chapter of the book proposal was this piece called Donald Trump is Gaslighting America. Um, Mm -hmm. And it was published to Teen Vogue. So because it was published to Teen Vogue, I became this kind of informal ambassador for young people. And I was being asked this question of why don't young people care? Or how can we get more young people to care? Why don't young women care? And it's all total nonsense because I Mm. did not care before. I thought that Mm. I cared and I didn't have this sense of agency. And so a lot of the work that I do in the book is looking at how have we been alienated? What are the means by which the system actually boxes out the voices of the majority of the public and then is further compounded by um, the stigmatization of youth voices and of young Mm. people as second class citizens politically. And um, then throughout uh, some of what I learned in the groups I was talking to and the inspiring examples I was seeing is that the most critical thing to snapping out of that alienation is seeing concrete examples of people doing the damn thing. And so uh, Mm -hmm. another big piece of my book is demonstrating it through, um, I interviewed hotshots like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and David Mm -hmm. Amor, but also people that you've never heard of running down ballot elections. And what I noticed is that you, you often there's this sense of abstraction of like, yes, in a democracy, people can be going to town halls, but not that you should be doing that thing yourself. And um, Mm -hmm. and it ends, it builds to this call to action saying that what, what exactly does it mean to be a citizen? And so step one of being a citizen is vote, you know, voting. We all please everyone vote, 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 vote. Um, Mm -hmm. But beyond that most basic transactional mode of participation, we all need to have these constant daily habits and what that looks like is going to be specific to each and every person and based on every person's individual habits, but it has to be this discipline um, and being a citizen has to be something that we do truly, truly all the time and um, and yeah. commit to in the same way we would commit to working out. We just fit it into our schedule and do the, the, the activities that fit best for us. Um, and it's necessary for that work to build up as individual action into collective mm-hmm. power for us to have anything even remotely resembling true democracy. Yeah. I've heard you say in interviews and even in our conversation right now that you used to think of democracy as something that kind of took care of itself, right? Like a, a magical thing. Yeah. How do you think about democracy now? I think of democracy as actually quite a bit of work and that I would like to Mm -hmm. do convincingly uh, make the case that we all do have to do it. And um, Mm -hmm. that I think of democracy now as a a habit and a discipline that I was expanded also to the just a a, a constant sense of agency needing to be Mm -hmm. a habit and a discipline and to be kind of consciously actively processing um, who, who makes the rules. And there's just so many times that we're going through the motions and I don't think we even realize it. Um, And, and part of what I want to create is, is not just civic action in the traditional sense, but to give, to make, especially young people feel empowered to always be poking at that stock script as it's been fed to us. Yes. Yes. You know, um, I'm glad that you mentioned that because I was going to ask you about your belief in in traditional politics and because it seemed like it's very strong, but then you also just seem to mention that you're also talking about going on, going beyond voting. So I wonder if I can ask you kind of a two part question there. Like yeah. what, what makes you believe so strongly in traditional politics and 
And what are the things that you think that we need to do beyond voting? Yeah. So I, I think that um, the, tr- the, the traditional system needs to be overthrown and that we need a rich <laughs> ecosystem of methods to make that happen. And I would include mm-hmm. as a potential civic action protesting. Um, and yes. I would definitely, definitely that counts as a civic action as far as I'm concerned. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that well, any thing you do to make your voice heard demonstratively with action that you take is the work of citizenship. And like just the idea of activism has been so stigmatized. Um, I mean, I feel the way I was, I understood activism as some fringe radical behavior and like weirdly associated with weird, like long armpit hair. Like I just didn't even know. (laughs) (laughs) And now I'm like, we all need to be activists always. What? (laughs) You know, also like I learned about, we learned about the stuff of democracy in school as these bullet points um, Mm -hmm. where it's like, Oh, now women got the right to vote. Well, yeah, that took, about a hundred years of work right. and and yeah. it, like this it took about a hundred years of activism actually um mm-hmm. so, so i think that um there's a lot of, di- of different options for those activities so th- there are some that are more traditional like contacting your elected officials and attending town halls or making donations but i i think that it's it's it is any way of of making noise and affecting community your community and the collective and so i would include protesting and i would include demonstrating and i would i would just include also other creative means of of organizing mm-hmm. and building individual action into greater impact in smaller groups and at the local level and maybe it's something also that seems um less political in the spicy sense like it's Mm -hmm. you think that there needs to be a countdown clock at this intersection because it's really dangerous that's also uh demonstrating a duty to the collective i Mm -hmm. feel like it's about how how are you what what do you believe in what's what's your commitment to the, the the people around you and how are you going to contribute to um, living in the world you wish to see? And I think that maybe part of the thing that's overwhelming is, is that they, it can look so many different ways. But I, I think that the more and more that people are flexing the muscle and seeing inspiring examples of people just not waiting for permission and doing the damn thing, the more creative. Yeah. People get. Yeah. One thing that I appreciate about your voice is when I hear you speak about these things, like I can sense the passion that you have for your message and bringing this to everyone who needs to hear this. But the truth is that we need like every like everyday average person to be involved and active on the things that matter. Like that's the only way that we're going to have the changes that we need. Mm -hmm. Um, On that note. You know, I'm watching Watchmen on the weekend and I'm watching The Flash, you know, you know, you know, like I'm paying attention to pop culture stuff. Like those are the things that a lot of us, we have our interests. We have the things that we like, our everyday things that that aren't, you know, all that serious all the time. And so I'm, I'm leading up to like this, you know, taking a long time to lead into this question. But because you do work in media and you work with Teen Vogue, I'm wondering how you're thinking about the role of media, like pop culture media mm-hmm. to to influence the revolution that we need? I think that it's difficult because there is a lot, there are a lot of challenges in mainstream newsrooms that are part of Mm -hmm. enforcing the status quo. And Mm -hmm. I, I think that we need new solutions and a new use of journalism. And I think that journalism only has one side and that that side is establishing equitable public power. It's journalism's role in a democracy is empowering citizens with information and the, the, that the information that we need to participate. Um, And I think Mm -hmm. uh, there's, that should be the emphasis should always be on that aim of true democracy. And part of the obstacle in the way that the, the, the mainstream media has attempted to react to this democratic crisis is uh, an appearance of objectivity and an, a, a playing towards 
the idea of the neutrality of the press mm-hmm. and the idea that there needs to be uh, equal representation of viewpoints and even when those viewpoints include hate speech and it's mm-hmm. this really dangerous warping problem by which the far right hatred including um active bigotry towards the LGBT community um, and uh, various myths that enforce and perpetuate sexism and racism are treated as one side of an issue and then marginalized groups mm. whose, whose humanity is under attack is treated as the other side of the issue when I think that the whole side of the issue that everyone should be interested in is humanity and, and mm-hmm. in a bigger sense creating the situation in which we all have equal political footing to weigh in on our democracy. But as a press, that means we should be um, actually, I think, transparently, openly, rigorously working towards the goal of establishing true democracy. So it's like a way, here's a, here's a concrete example of, of what's going wrong. The coverage mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. impeachment um, has representations of this vote that's going to come up in the Senate. And even the, the New York Times will write... Oh, that we need, we need twenty. We need twenty Republicans to side with Democrats, and most observers don't think that's going to happen. And then that's just presented as as fact, basically. And it's just, well, we, we don't mm-hmm. we don't think that that these Republicans are going to vote with this other team. It's like, first of all, this is not a matter of two teams. It's a matter of the sanctity of our democracy. And second of all, mm-hmm. it's actually patently absurd that any elected official would in any way be demonstrating allegiance to their party affiliation over the public opinion on impeachment proceedings. And you as a journalist Mm -hmm. ought to be providing context for that. And instead, you're enforcing this sense of inevitability around the idea that this is the way these things will unfold. And the direct result of that is the kind of alienation that I'm trying to fight with How to Start a Revolution but it's totally reasonable for for most people to feel as if there's nothing they can do and their voices don't matter. And like mm. these proceedings are just going to unfold in this way in accordance with how the two teams interact. And the best we can do is, I don't know, get some popcorn. <laughs> yeah, so the, the media right now is kind of disempowering us. Is that what you're saying? Definitely, definitely. And, and I think that we need more courage and we need more conviction and we need to make more, take more risks and make mistakes. So I think that there's a lot of fear um, and, and laziness that goes into the both sides kind of mm-hmm. thinking like, I don't think mm-hmm. that it is always nefarious. There's, there's a far right ecosystem that disseminates dis- disinformation into the mainstream conversation. Mm -hmm. But in terms of like the average mainstream journalist, a lot of the time it's being on a deadline and not having enough coffee and making a lazy word choice or or, or just going the Mm. stock thing and and not actively consciously processing it and challenging it. Um, And I think that there's a fear um, in terms of going with the safe bet. And so here's an example, uh, calling out the president's lies uh, and calling them lies. And for example, we're told there's this mm-hmm. whole conversation about that. And the idea is, well, and the, again, the New York Times, uh, Maggie Haberman was specifically saying, well, we don't know his intention. So how can we say it's a lie? Well, okay. <laughs> well, okay. So like, let's unpack that. If you, if, if the president has now said something that is not true and you're telling me, you don't know what is going on in his head, then there are several possibilities here. One is that he's mentally unfit. Two is that he, uh, he is not being given accurate information and therefore by the high, the most powerful person in the land is uninformed or three, he's lying. And if you're not going to, Mm-hmm. The word lie, and you all you just you need to unpack all the rest of that context so that people um, ha- have the conviction to say the president is lying to us. That's a much more powerful position to put a reader in than a, a falsehood mm-hmm. and like all this equivocation. And another example is right. racially charged, right? Like racially charged. Mm-hmm. You toss on a little charged to that. This little, it's it's then it's just about race, right? Like that's a totally different thing than saying racist. And you know, like there are so many things that the president has done 
that are concrete examples of racism. I mean, the man introduced his campaign by calling Mexicans rapists. Like, this is not hard. Yes. And, and I think that it's a laziness. And so so I guess the, the, the other point that I was beginning to make before I got angry about lies and, and <laughs> <laughs> um, was I think you know there are these these standards and practices about how journalism is conducted and they exist for mm-hmm. a reason, but times mm-hmm. are changing and evolving and and are actually our idea of objectivity is is even like a relatively new concept in the history of American journalism and um, journalism as it stands is not a profession. It's a trade and it's based on human decisions. And and not everyone is a journalist, but everyone ha- can be a journalist if they are mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. motivated by an allegiance to the truth and they practice objectivity of method. And so I think that I'm trying to do a lot of different things in this space, using my voice, um, offering up myself as a, a, an example of a young woman with personal political agency and sharing pieces of my personal life and just, just a total uh, access to my brain in a way that is more of what you'd expect from an influencer. But then I'm also holding mm-hmm. myself to journalistic standards and not trying to manipulate people and not cherry picking information and just telling you the truth as they see it. And Definitely, I have made mistakes, not just as a journalist, as a human being, and I'm sure that I'll make more mistakes, guaranteed. But I think that there's the, the from that basis of operating with objectivity of method in order to empower people with information, there's so much that's uh, available um, and there's so much that we can do given the power of the internet and given the power of organization on social media and of individual voices to break through and cut through the noise. And I think that there's room for experimentation and um, healthy mistakes that then, of course, hopefully will be transparently and thoughtfully corrected. But um, I think we have to not live in fear and we we have to kind of make some more of those good mistakes um, and, and fight against Trump and fight for building sustainable equality at, by taking risks that are built on this underlying motivation, which is just really empowering people with the information they need to have agency. Mm. Wow. Yes. <laughs> so much there. Sorry, long answer. Long answer. <laughs> no, that's not, it's not that it's long. It's just that it's so good. I'm like, we're we're going a bit over time and I'm like, but I could literally talk to her like for the rest of the day. Um, I have two more questions yeah. for you. The first is, what did you find in your research for the book that makes you hopeful about change now? Actually, so much. Um, so I the, was so inspired by all of these exceptional examples and the thing is, it's not just about Trump, this political awakening that's happened. And I've talked about this a little more, too. It's like this political awakening is about moving. The, the political awakening is about moving from passively navigating the system to actively seeking to change it. And the Black Lives Matter movement mm-hmm. ushered that in in a big way. And Parkland shifted the way that looked for gun reform. And Me Too shifted the way that looked for gender relations. And what Trump's mm-hmm. Trump's election just set off this miraculous number of them all at once in one night. Um, but it, mm-hmm. it, the what it really looks like is people feeling empowered to do the shit they care about with this total sense of righteous purpose. And so like, there was a mm-hmm. young woman who was covering the school board as a high school student. And she thought, well, maybe this shouldn't just be like wealthy moms and local businessmen. Maybe there should be a student on here and thought, well, I'll, I'll do that eventually and like be able to offer that perspective. But first I have to, do graduate from school and be successful in this other area. And then I'll come back. Trump went won. She decided mm-hmm. to run. She won and she's on the school board. So it wasn't about Trump. It was, she cared about this thing before there was this thing she thought she might be good at before. And then she said, I'm not waiting for permission anymore. And basically all of the stories mm-hmm. uh, that I look at fit that mold where it's, it's the, the, the thing that happens in the awakening is not that you start to care and it's not, you Mm. it's that you 
feel an urgency of action and then commit to doing the thing yourself. The thing that you were waiting for someone else to do and hoping that someone else to do or, or waiting for your turn. And so the thing that makes me most helpful, I, I got worried um, <laughs> partway through my research because I thought, well, uh, yeah, I'm optimistic because I'm spending all my days talking to young people who are really pumped and doing the 100% mm-hmm. life change reaction mm-hmm. to this. Um, but what we, what we need is is to see how this can look for the average person. And that the piece of that that uh, yeah. gave me hope at generational scale is um, this millennial impact report that showed that shift from passively not being broken system to actively seeking to change it in a way that we can talk about at a demographic level. And I think that uh, the evidence is only piling up. I mean, the historic turnout in the midterms, I really don't think got the kind of coverage it deserved. Like, Historic turnout in the midterms. The average young person wouldn't have even known the midterms were happening before. Um, and, and we're we're seeing, you know, youth insurgencies and climate marches and gutter marches. Like the, the 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 levels of student action um, have only increased and expanded. Um, and I think that the particular circumstances that make it so uh, stressful and spicy and difficult to be alive right now necessarily will push more and more people to to have this awakening and to understand that we all have a duty to be working to untangle this disgusting oppressive system um and i think that we're in a really painful phase of it right now because it the he, Donald Trump is still in the White House and it's only it's mm-hmm. only just the beginnings of this shift. Um but I really do believe that what we are working towards will be better than anything we can possibly imagine. And I, I mean I, I think that it really is a, a level of untangling the the hateful, oppressive uh realities that make it so that we are all pushed out of feeling like our voices have any reason to matter. So like the average person, right? Maybe the young person says, well, I don't know if I have time for that because I'm working multiple jobs in a gig economy and I'm paying off my student loans and I don't know if I can find healthcare. And I would say to you that that's the, absolutely the exact same reason that you need to, to find the time to do something yeah. because mm-hmm. the the system as it stands has made it so that we're not able to enjoy our lives and that we're used as products and squ- crushed to our smallest capacities and feel as if it's totally reasonable to not expect solutions for our political problems and i i think that we all we all owe it to each other to participate in this thing and when we as we grow to the establishing more of the collective impact that comes from this individual action building up, we're going to start to see shifts and and, and policies that emphasize humanity um, and a society that emphasizes a duty to the collective. Um, and, and I really believe that it's n- worth the effort slash the only really choice we have if we'd like to survive. Um, <laughs> right? Yeah. No. So true. Yeah. So true. So I've, I've heard you mention that you are looking at possibly a, a, some kind of lifestyle change mm. in a year. Like you're giving yourself another year to kind of pound the pavement with this yeah. message. What's that about? Uh, it's been really tiring and it's been really hard to um, give everything I've got to trying mm-hmm. to share this, to trying to, I don't know, fight for democracy and be, torn down and ripped Mm -hmm. apart and in all different ways. Um, And there's been, you know, extreme far right harassment and hit pieces on me, which I actually, you know, it's like, uh, I, 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 I don't even totally understand how the people who are writing them 
um, are thinking about what they're writing because the the hit pieces about me have found that there are weird rumors about me behaving like an asshole, which is, t- first of all, not proven. And second of all, totally possible in tandem with doing great work. And I just, you know, I think, I think it's mm-hmm. really disturbing that uh, if you take a step back, you look and say, who are the other young women with prominent voices in the political conversation? And it, it just, it, inarguably, there's not enough examples. And that, that mm-hmm. in, to, to have sustained a voice and to have held myself up as an example of a young woman who can have the conviction of personal agency um, has come with such aggressive and egregious attacks. Um, it seems terrifically obvious to me but um i mean i guess th- that i am biased to myself and i have to admit that but <laughs> i i guess i it's really also a weird thing being public facing and um interacting with mm-hmm. an idea of myself is is it's pretty dehumanizing um even even yeah. when it's not the negativity like just people think that they know me and that they they have a full picture they can have a full picture of who I am based on s- fragments and snippets of of things that they've seen and um it's really pushed me actually to do a lot of personal healing and grounding in forming a sense of self that I did not have before um but I feel the toll that it is taking um and so I don't know that I am 100% going to quit after election day, but mm-hmm. I'm at least committed to seeing this thing through. I mean, I was catapulted to this platform with that gasoline article going mm-hmm. viral and I've, I've survived so much crazy shit in continuing to speak up. And I, I wrote a book that I could not be more proud in. And I think that now this last leg is about going off that foundation um, and spreading it into the world as best that I can. Um, and if I choose to move to the woods after that, then, then I will. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, many, many have, <laughs> many have gone off the grid. <laughs> and on that note, I just want to thank you again so much for this conversation. Thank you for coming on the show and sharing about your book and, I'm sure that I speak for everyone on our team and our listeners when we say that, you know, we hope that you do what is best for you. Yeah. And thank you for what you've done so far. Thank you so much. I could really have talked to you for a very long time and I appreciate this interview. Thank you. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. All right. We'll talk soon. Okay. Bye. All right, so Nandi, let's talk about, you know, what the interview brought up for you, you know, just, yeah, what are, what are things that you felt like, I mean, you mentioned earlier that, you know, she was really speaking to some things that you're thinking about yeah. a lot, so. So, yeah, um, one thing that really resonated with me from this interview is her talking about how uh, we have to move past voting since Donald yeah. Trump has gotten elected, everyone has been talking about vote, vote, vote. But mm-hmm. you only get to vote a few times in a term. Voting is right. not something that's uh, consistent enough to make change. And as we see, there's some things you can't just vote away. Like you right. can't vote away police brutality. You can't right. vote away, you know, unjustified murders by the state. Those can't be right. voted away. And so... Mm-hmm. When Lauren talks about, you know, actions in your community, local actions, how she talked about how Donald Trump's uh, election sparked a wave of, you know, right. actions in so many different e- uh, efforts. She talks about Me Too, the Black Lives mm. Matter movement, which was sparked under Obama's presidency. I mean, right. it's ushered in a whole wave of actions that happen outside of voting. So for me, right. especially right now, It's encouraging to know that people who are writing books and stuff realize the importance of direct action, of taking steps outside of voting, besides voting and learning. You know, I think she described democracy as the question of how we will all live together. I think that Mm. was kind of how she Mm -hmm. said it. And I really liked that because 
Yeah. We do need to think about how we all live together. And when you look at that question, it goes way beyond voting. So that really just stuck out for me. Yeah. I mean, this, that's what this whole podcast and the email list is all right. about. It's all about how we take action, the power that we have to create change. And voting is just one tactic of many that we can incorporate. But, you know, I think that's why that resonates with me so much to hear you say that is like, we come from people who had to take their freedom, their liberation into their own hands. They realized that the official political channels were not working for them and they weren't going to work for them. Mm -hmm. So they, they organized themselves for, for the changes that they wanted to see. And the political system actually had to catch up to them. Right. right? And I love like the, the bringing up that, voting you know you and i have had conversations with actual revolutionaries right. and, so, and who have talked about voting and i think that my perspective changed on voting to understand it as it's important to the state because it lends the state legitimacy mm -hmm. right whoever can say well i won the election can mm -hmm. by extension you know say that well i have the right to rule one of the ways that we can take that power away from them or we can challenge that power is by voting in an opposite direction with the hope of putting the stamp on them that this actually wasn't the desire of the people. Right. But as I say that, I think about how like everyone says that Donald Trump didn't have the popular vote in 2016. Hillary Clinton did, you know. And that hasn't stamped him as illegitimate for a lot of people. Mm. But it, it, it has for some people. Yeah. But there's a whole bunch of people who just don't even care. That is a great point, um, especially just because when you talk about legitimizing the state through voting, you think about how many things are, quote unquote, legal. Right. right. But like un not justice. They're unjust. Right. When she talks about like participating in citizens, when we talk about like harnessing like citizen power, mm. voting is one way. <laughs> But like right. I said, there's things that we that you can try to delegitimize the state. But like you said, especially I think in this presidency, we've seen that normal tactics that would delegitimize a leader haven't even worked. Uh, we're right. looking at this kind of like cult fandom of a mm. person who is completely like unfit to lead anything. Right. Like mm -hmm. what he shouldn't be leading a thing. So, I mean, seriously, like if you order McDonald's for your people, like you shouldn't be running whatever it is that you're running. Like, if I mean, <laughs> if that's your staff lunch, unless it's unless you work at McDonald's, you know, like, there was no then. reason for that. <laughs> <laughs> fine food, fine food. <laughs> You know, but dictators call elections all the time to try to re-legitimize yeah. their rule, right? They'll call they'll call elections whenever they want to, you facts. know? Like, if they feel like they're losing legitimacy with the people, they call an election. And that election is kind of like just signaling to the populace. Oh, but... The people like me. Yeah, I'm, I belong here. I they belong think here. I'm Look doing great. Votes. Very great. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the point that you're making, too, though... Like the thing that you said when you were like, yeah, we've seen things that normally would legitimize, but they but they don't right now mm -hmm. um, or delegitimize, but they don't right now. I think that a lot of people right now are not facing the fact that Trump's base does not care about mm. acting in good faith right now. Come on. The white nationalist movement in America is not a good faith movement. Definitely not. So it doesn't really care about the law the rule of law, unless the rule of law is the caste system. That is the rule of law Ooh. they are interested in. And the law will only serve that caste system. And that's the one they want to abide by. Right. You know, the thing that they want to do is not have liberty and justice for everyone, you know. Just for some. Right. They, they want to maintain their position in that caste system. I mean, right now, what I'm thinking about, and we haven't, we haven't talked about what came up for me, but, mm. um, but 
right but now, now we can talk about, about it. <laughs> <laughs> we can get to that. What you, what what came up for you is bringing up a lot for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but what I'm thinking about right now is how the American common sense is finally around race is finally in contention mm. again, right? Because it hasn't been for a long time. Right. For a long time, black people have been shouting, protesting, lamenting, you know, our, our position in this caste system. But many white people have felt like, and non-black people have felt like there's no, they don't have to even argue with us about it because They're so opposed and we did not, we had not built the power yet, I I think is how I want to say it, to where this became something that the whole country had to talk talk about. Right. Right. But now we're in a place where the Black Lives Matter movement has really moved the needle on our common sense to the Mm -hmm. point where there are millions of non-Black people, too, in addition to Black people, who are asking questions about our fundamental institutions about the fundamental nature of American society and all that. And when you have the White House, right, Mm. issuing an executive order saying that, you know, we can't or they they don't want any government agencies hiring anti-racism educators. You have entered into a new phase of the movement because that means that, oh, no, if we have to use executive power to try to keep the truth of America from being spoken, we are finally in, at that point where we are in contention over the common sense of America. And so in that way, it actually makes me, th- there's a little bit of hope in there. Yeah, I got me. a little fired up when you said that. I'm like, yes, yeah. they're scared. Yeah, there's a little bit of hope in me about that because at least they do feel like this is a real threat. Mm-hmm. And it's not, they're not talking about, well, they kind of are talking, you know, with these crazy conspiracy theories about Black Lives Matter burning down forests in oh, Portland yeah. and stuff Antifa like that. Antifa as well. But the fact that they are so concerned about guarding white supremacy on the, on the symbolic level, on the ideological level, I mean, mm-hmm. that, I, I don't know what exactly we need to do in this moment, but I feel like we need to lean into that momentum. So when Lauren talked about the media and like, I just think of how much propaganda that yes. I've seen just yes. over. I don't even know if propaganda was like really in my vocabulary, except right. in the past four years, because it's just been so blatant. Right. But how they've lent to Trump, I mean, to legitimizing him in so much is like we see that Hillary won the popular vote. You know, the yep. electoral college needs to go. But like Trump is like, I'm legitimate. The people voted for me. And I'm like, right, <sighs> right. There's a lot of changes to be done, but I think that Lauren really is on to something with all the ways that she's encouraging people to fight back and think about how they can participate better. Well, we need we need millions of ordinary people to believe in their power, to know their power and to use it, you know, and we need millions of ordinary people to basically believe in revolution, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, if we're going to have one. I know, right. what what you when you were talking about the anti racism you know you know the way that the the way that the that this white nationalist movement is fighting so hard against it, it and they have the they have the president on their side right mm-hmm. to try to enforce the caste system and the the sim I hate the, I hate using jargon now I'm trying to get away from jargon ah uh. but. <laughs> I don't know a better word for this than Sometimes it works. <laughs> cultural hegemony. Uh, <laughs> like the yeah. the white, um, how you want to say de- hegemony, like the dominant culture, the prevailing mm-hmm. ideology, uh, the prevailing white supremacist ideology, the white supremacist common sense that we mm, have in America. Yes. That's, that's what I was saying. White supremacist right? common sense. You need to <laughs> <Yeah>. coin that. <laughs> that, <laughs> that, um, <laughs> They're, they're, they really want to guard it. It seemed by executive order and possibly it seemed, it sounded like the president said the other day, something like he wanted, like if he could make it illegal, he would like to, to speak of America as a fundamentally racist nation, as a place that was built on these ideas of white supremacy, which is just plain fact. But anyway, the thing that I think about that is that that is going to backfire. Whoa. 
if these people who say that they're all about anti-racism now are serious, right, who have been brought into the movement by people like Austin Channing Brown and Rachel Cargill and, right. and all these others, uh, Ijeoma, you know, right, and others yeah. who have brought, you know, who people are following. If they're serious about what they're saying, making everything that they've learned is likely to backfire. The thing that I hope is that teachers who are told that they're not allowed to teach these things, that they're willing to go to jail, they're yeah. willing to be arrested to tell yeah. the truth about America. I hope that journalists are willing to uh, to to risk their careers to tell the truth mm. about America. I hope that pastors and preachers and other mm. clergy who have people sitting down in front of them every Friday or Saturday or Sunday or Wednesday will be willing to risk arrest to go to jail to tell the truth about America. You know, one of the challenges, and I I wonder if I should even say this out loud because <laughs> I don't want to give the enemy ideas. But I mean, listen, they they tend to be arrogant about their ability to hold on to this common sense yeah. and to to keep this common sense as the dominant common, common sense of our country. But one of the challenges of racism and or fighting racism in the past couple of decades, I think, has been that we haven't had the whites only signs up anymore. Mm. Right. We haven't had these very clear, obvious symbols of white supremacy. But when you say that we can't talk about how this um, how this country was built on human hierarchy with race being mm -hmm. the signifier of who stands where in that caste system. You have just set up an opportunity for civil disobedience, Absolutely. for mass civil disobedience. I think <laughs> about how that excites me. Yeah, I mean, I think about how every time I get banned on Facebook, I'm just like, I will say something worse now. <laughs> like, I, will I, say something I worse now. like I will say something way worse. Um, I not that I'm saying anything that's untrue. Obviously, most right. of the time I'm getting banned for saying true things about men mostly mm. men every now and then <laughs> something about white people will kind of right. get me flagged but that yeah. just that in itself makes me want to you know do more i'm like yeah ban me again facebook see what else i post you know so that yeah. on a scale of people who have made this kind of their life's work good luck yeah, I mean, like, I, I've been thinking about what Thoreau said in his treatise, Civil Disobedience. Mm. And he said, you know, in an unjust society, the place for a righteous person is in prison. Whoa! <laughs> you know, and so or I'm, I'm paraphrasing him in that. I'm not, yeah. It's not a direct quote, but he says something like that. And I'm thinking about, yo, if you make it illegal for us to tell the truth about America's history, Y'all think you're the jail's doing, full now. You are setting up the conditions for revolution, right? When these dictators overstep, when they get cocky and they think, oh, they're just, oh, you go ahead and do that. You go ahead and do that, especially in a country that is built on the idea of free speech. Right? Listen, <laughs> Americans are too free to be told things. I mean, we just see how uh, are USians. I'm trying to get away from using Americans. USians. USians. Uh, <laughs> look at how they responded to being told to wear a mask in a pandemic. Right. And this isn't the right. first time that people didn't want to wear masks in a pandemic. They didn't want to yeah. wear them in 1920 either. And that's one thing actually before Trump got elected. I remember like yelling at people at all my serving jobs. When he started yeah. running, I was like, he's going to win watch right. i was like right. he's definitely gonna win but hopefully it'll wake some people up right. i've seen that it did wake some people up it some did. people who i thought had no hope it uh did. it woke them up and they were like wow this is really bad now and i'm like yeah. okay <laughs> now <laughs> now all right <laughs> but you're here guys america just got bad <laughs> yeah, right if you, how many like i mean i can't count how many times i heard that like it's going to be really bad for you. I'm so nervous about like what your life is going to be like. I'm like, Ooh. sis, my life is already like. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But I mean, good luck, uh, Trump. I think that we have a long fight ahead of us. And I think that Lauren definitely puts that into perspective. Like, yes, yeah. vote. 
And I also like that she talked about kind of the fatigue of the work she's been doing. Yes, she talks about, yes. you know, possibly after the election, she might move off into the woods. And you <laughs> and I have the conversation of expatriation so often. Yes, yeah. <laughs> no, it doesn't have to be. Doesn't have to be this way. Doesn't have to be. No, it doesn't have to be this way. Okay, hard pill for today. Nandi, what's yours? So I think my hard pill after listening to Lauren is that you cannot wait to vote. Mm, um, mm -hmm. Waiting to vote, it just doesn't come around enough. And there's things that just cannot be voted away. And so my heart pill is like, if you're waiting to vote, stop waiting and do something right now. Yes. Yeah. No, I love that. My heart pill is about culture among left-leaning people. Mm. And if I were making a hard pill meme, I should add this to our hard pill, hard pill doc. Mm -hmm. um, I would say left culture can be toxic too. Ooh. During this global uprising, I'm out on the street again. I'm, you know, trying to organize with people again. It's not like I never noticed this stuff before, but I think sometimes in certain spaces, you don't, it's almost like you don't feel like you can name something as toxic, harmful, or wrong because we keep thinking in these binaries of right and wrong, right? Yes. So we think if we're among these people, then obviously we're practicing a better way. But the truth is we're all human and we find ways to do our messed up human stuff, no matter what language, fashion, iconography, mm -hmm. ideology, you know, we're ascribing to. And so I'm just noticing a lot of stuff among the movement mm -hmm. that I'm like, I think is counterproductive. And I'm like, I don't, I, I don't think we win that way. Talk about One it. book that I'm thinking about is Hegemony How To by Jonathan Smucker. And that's what his book is all about. And one thing that he talks about is that we tend to try to create these enclaves, like these progressive enclaves that become very insular and become more about infighting and self-righteousness than they do about building the capacity mm. for creating change. Mm. And I just see a lot of that. Sometimes I'm on the street in protests that I didn't, haven't organized in marches. And, you know, sometimes, you know, there's this chant that people do as they're passing by restaurants and they're like, while you're eating people dying, while you're eating people dying. Wow. And I'm like, yes, yeah, true. However, like, what if instead of trying to shame people while or they eating. eat dinner, <laughs> <laughs> what if we tried to communicate to them why we're in the street and invite them to join us? You know, um, because at the end of the day, we need a lot of people that are compelled by the same vision of tomorrow that we have that can align with it and that can get into the streets with us. You mm -hmm. know, and that's just an example. I mean, we could get further into the infighting and the problematic identity politics. I don't think that identity politics are altogether useless or harmful because we are living within political contexts that imbue our lives with political meaning. Right. And a lot of that has to do with our social location. So, and at the same time, some people are just weaponizing their identity so that they can consolidate power for themselves within a certain context, you know? And so I see, I'm just seeing stuff in, you know, left culture. The, the other thing that I wanted to, the one last thing that I would have mentioned was something that actually Sissy Ali from the Momentum mm -hmm. uh, community uh, mentioned because <laughs> they, they had this whole thing of asking people in this one workshop what are things in mainstream culture that you find toxic? And then what are things that you see in left culture that you find mm -hmm. toxic? Mm -hmm. And one thing that they they coined a phrase, radical signaling. And I just loved this. Uh, yes. <laughs> and they were like, yeah, radical signaling. It's like when someone is in, you know, the group and they say, it's because of cis hetero patriarchy, da da da. And everyone goes, mm. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I spent so much time like that. doing that. Mm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Mm, I spent a ton of time doing that. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is that all of these things, you know, they feel good to the people that are performing them. But right. at the end of the day, they are not power. Mm. Right. Yeah. And I know a lot of people don't like thinking about power and talking about power, but it, like it or not, this is a power struggle. And the yeah. thing that we need in order to win the, the kind of change that we want to see in the world 
is power. Power doesn't have to dominate others. It doesn't have to be oppressive power, but we do need power, which is basically the ability to act. It's the ability mm -hmm. to bring about something that you want to see in the world. We got to have that. Yeah. So that's my hard pill is like, you know, uh, we need to take ourselves off the pedestal, mm -hmm. <laughs> stop fighting with each other and focus on the bigger picture and what yeah. we want to accomplish. And we need to do what we need to do to build the capacity so we can get free. And don't be offended left leaning people unless this applies directly to you. And then I encourage <laughs> you to just interrogate that and interrogate that feeling of, are you engaging in some of the same tactics that you say that you abhor? Right. Are you using the same ones? You know, right. and I think that that's the que the real question, right? And I think that people who, especially like like myself, who I'm like, I don't I ident really identify in politics. I don't necessarily right. find myself reflected in politics. I don't right. identify with the right or the left, but I right. see them doing a lot of similar things, which is the right. reason why. I feel like exactly. neither one of them is a place for me. So exactly. that's great, Andre. Yeah, I don't I don't identify as left either. And I think that's mm -hmm. partly why, like, I just all I care about is us getting free. Yeah. You know, but as I watch this and I've said this to you, I, I mean, there have been like really black. There have been black radical thinkers in history that end up just becoming conservatives. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, I've looked at it and been like, yeah, I kind of get it. Like, I'm not going to become a conservative, right. but I kind of get some of the critiques that they bring up and they're not altogether wrong about it. And I think what made me think about it was I saw like I saw one pretty influential, you know, thinker who talks some about race. Yeah. Kind of shit on anti-racism educators, you know, mm -hmm. um, I mean, the streets are, are one thing that I was that have made me think about it. But I saw them, you know, they were like basically saying anti-racism isn't helpful for black people. Mm. And I was thinking like, well, I mean, it's fine. We should critique anti-racism work. We should, we should critique all these different, you know, yeah. approaches to racial justice work. And at the same time, I think of my friends and people that I respect who are anti-racism educators who literally have people trying to find their address and send them, you know, hazardous material, mm -hmm. you know, who send death threats to their emails and all this right. kind of stuff. And I'm like, you know what we could be doing instead of, you know, telling one another that we don't matter or that we don't count or that our work is, you know, not valuable. Mm. You know, we could be working together to, you know, remove these barriers to our own flourishing. <laughs> right. You know, and sometimes I think it's not even that like we don't even have to work together. It's like you could just worry about your what you're doing and I could just right. worry about what I'm doing right, right. Just no. mind yeah. your business and drink water like if you don't think <laughs> that this is the way that you're totally that's you're totally entitled to think that way but you can think that way like over where you are like please don't disparage you know the time and sweat and energy and just all the work that goes into like, you know, and things like anti-racism education, because the same people, especially the same black people who are doing anti-racism education are critiquing anti-racism education also, even right. in their own work. Like, right. I know that I often like interrogate, you know, how much like my work is centering whiteness, you know, mm -hmm. like how I can educate in a way that does not center whiteness even though mm -hmm. a lot of anti-racism education is cater is for white people that right. doesn't necessarily mean that we have to center whiteness in doing it right. so i encourage people that uh want to critique any method of how people are pursuing liberation to just worry about yourself and what your place in the world is and like like let's not spend time tearing each other down we all want to get free. And just because right. your version of free doesn't look like my version or my tactics getting there doesn't look like how you would get there doesn't mean that we have to attack each other. Yeah, I'm trying to learn how to be generous in, in my criticism altogether, yeah. you know, so, generous in my critique. So even like the stuff that I mentioned about being on the street and thinking like, I think that we could be more strategic about that. Like, I try to like work on my language so that I'm not just like, yeah, well, that's dumb, <laughs> you know, or whatever. I try to like always like acknowledge that there is some value 
in this, that, that, you know, try to affirm whatever value is there. And, you know, also, you know, add that other, other part. So Nandi, any, any questions that you're left with after listening to Lauren's interview? I think my question, one of the main questions I have is for journalists and mm-hmm. people who are reporting the news right now, what will you do mm. to take a stance, take a side, you know, like creating art. And I, I still think that journalism is art in a way mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. It, you can't not take a side. There's no objectivity, I think, mm. in storytelling. And so I wonder journalists and storytellers and news reporters What will you do to stand against this authoritarian dictator? What will you do Mm. to change uh, the trajectory? And what will you do to kind of further this revolution uh, right now, thought revolution that we're having? What will you do to further that? Right. I think I have a similar question to folks who find themselves in other institutions in society. What are you going to do if this regime tries to make it illegal to tell the truth about this country, you know, are you going to comply? Because this is exactly what I've been talking about for two years, you know, with hope and hard pills. That would be the moment that we've been waiting for. Yeah. You know, just like Dr. King said, I think that he was paraphrasing someone else when he said it, but we have an obligation to disobey unjust laws. Yeah. Right. So if we find ourselves in a situation where we are told that we'll be punished for saying that this country was built on white supremacy, on white supremacist ideology, and that it has a white supremacist common sense. What are you going to do? What are you going to personally do to refuse to comply with that? Yeah, I think I also want to ask any regular, ordinary, you know, outraged folks, what will you do today? You know, Mm -hmm. what will you do between now and the election? What will you do after the election? Mm -hmm. You know, when we talk about moving past voting, what does that look like for you and your community? Well, thanks for listening to another episode of the Hope and Heart Pills podcast. Nandi, thanks for co-hosting with me this time. Thank you. This was so great. We're such a good team. It was super fun. This is our first time co-hosting. What a shame. (laughs) (laughs) Agreed. We should do more of that. We should. All right. Well, y'all know that Ross is going to tell you more about the podcast, where you can uh, stay connected with us, how you can join our team at Hope and Hard Pills. Enjoy the smooth sounds of our resident white person, Ross Montgomery and podcast podcast producer telling you all about that. And we will talk to you next time. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening today. If you like what you heard and you haven't already, please subscribe on your favorite podcatcher. Leaving a rating and review on Apple Podcasts also helps us get into more ears and minds. This podcast is made possible by our incredible patrons. Thank you for being part of our work at Hope and Hard Pills. As usual, you'll get the uncut extended version of this episode on Patreon. We are grateful for you as a listener, and we love being able to provide conversations with these incredible guests for free without ads. If you want to be a part of supporting the work with not only the podcast, but with all Hope and Hard Pills is doing, your best option is to join the Patreon. Look us up at patreon.com slash Andre Henry. To go deeper, get subscribed to our email newsletter. Head over to andrerhenry.com and click join the movement where you'll get practical insight on anti-racism and social change every week. And you'll never miss a new article, song, or podcast episode. You can also follow Andre Henry on Facebook and Instagram at the Andre Henry. Connect with Nandi on Twitter and Instagram at Nandi K. That's N-A-N-D-I-K-A-Y-Y-Y. That's three Y's at the end. That's all for this episode of the Hope and Hard Pills podcast. See you next time.